there. Welcome to this episode of the Skiff Meetings podcast. Now, this podcast episode is about AI. Before you say, hey, another episode, another piece of content about AI, bear with us. This is taking a very different approach. We're asking some serious questions about the usefulness of AI and whether AI has actually jumped the shark. In other words, has AI really overcome its usefulness? Are we beyond the first positive impressions of AI? And of course, this is a tough question to ask. We don't know the future, but we do know a lot of things that are working right now, a lot of event tech tools that are using AI in different ways. And with me to discuss this is Sean Cheng, also from his Mandarin name, Yixiang Cheng, the founder and lead strategist of Curious Bear Management. And he has a lot of interesting things to say about how he uses AI, how he's advising others to use AI. And we go into the depths of really what's actually working, what's impressing people, and what are people stepping back from around AI and tools that use AI around event technology. Hope you enjoy this podcast episode. Uh, I enjoyed definitely recording it and talking about this topic. And don't forget to check out the other episodes of the Skiff Meetings podcast. Subscribe, of course, and rate the podcast and review because that really helps us get more listeners. Stick around. Hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Skip Meetings podcast. I am delighted to be joined by Sean Cheng today, uh, an old uh, colleague, friend, uh, person I know from the industry, but also maybe I shouldn't say Sean Cheng, I should say Yi Xing, which is actually Sean's original name, original Mandarin name. Uh, Sean or Yi Xing, welcome to the show. Uh, one touch base start there like let's talk about your name i know this is quite common with with people from you know the with mandarin kind of being the first language but you don't normally use yi xiang so i want to want to start there and welcome you to the show with your with your real name i don't know if i should say your real name but your your kind of mandarin name right yeah no thanks um thanks for having me Miguel. and uh i think you 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 pronounce it properly uh it's yi xian and uh it is my mandarin name and um i'm i'm originally from taiwan and uh, I actually choose Sean when I moved to Canada uh, about 15 years ago. And it was it was it was out of I think uh, it's it's a, it's a common immigrant story, right? Like when you when you when you enter a new countries and you want to fit in, and you know 15 years ago that's what you do. You you kind of pick an English name so everyone can pronounce it. Uh, and and I think that's kind of come into lately uh, for the past couple of years that I think across different culture though I think everyone is starting to uh, not I, I like I, I don't like to use the word reclaim your your culture or your name because we never like at least I never uh, cross it out uh, like on my passport um, it's always my 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 Mandarin names and it just I didn't really talk about it. Um uh, mm-hmm. but I think it just like I, I started putting this uh on my basically on my signatures and and a lot of people knows um you know this is my 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 Mandarin's names and and I'm really proud of it. Um like Yixian right. is represent um uh, uh fly freely um which I think is actually really a beautiful name that kind of represent my personality as well. So Great. Well, glad we could glad we could start there. Now we met in Vancouver, I believe, in 2010 at the MPI yeah. WC event. I think you were a student or recently graduated at that point. Am I correct? I am student. I think I'm like about three months to graduation. Okay. Yeah, that was my my first biggest industry event, and definitely okay. hold a special place. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That was a memorable event. I think Vancouver had. I think not that long ago hosted the, the Winter Olympics, so there was a lot of kind of yes. flair around the city. It was it was kind of a special time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, really interesting. And then you went on to work with for MCI for a number of years. Uh, that did a number of different roles, right? And mm-hmm. now you're on your own, I believe, right? Curious Fair Management. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no. So, uh, so actually, after after WEC, uh, I end up picking up a summer job with Tourism Vancouver. Uh, and then I stay with the CVB for a couple of years and then have the opportunity to join MCI, uh, the Canada office. Uh, and that basically kind of my cornerstone, I would say, my 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 growth uh, in the industry, be able to do quite a variety of different projects and client. Uh, and then it's really actually after the post-pandemic. Um, I think pandemic uh, definitely, in fact, um, everyone's in different level. And, and for me, it's kind of like an interesting time 
for for starting a new chapter. Um, and then and I went on to work uh, a variety of different different projects. Uh, I work for a, a U.S. marketing agency, um, who's also I believe she's on the podcast before Dalia Ogazar for uh, uh, like a, a few years um, to tap into the marketing and consulting size. And and it's really starting from last year. I was um, just starting to uh, want to do something on my own. Um, I think uh, the the, the thought behind it is um, there's a lot of things I want to do, um, but is limited for you to do it when you uh, when other people decide what project you're working on, uh, and that's kind of how I starting to 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 do it on my own. So um, right now I'm I'm working with a variety of different people. Um, so I'm still working with quite a few. Actually, I work with quite a few different planner around the world on uh, different agencies, pick on different projects, but I also have my own projects. And uh, I was always joking that uh, for the past year and a half, the biggest lesson learned that I have is uh, I cannot complain anymore. It's, it's uh, your own it's, company and you make the decisions. Ex- exactly, complain. right? You, you choose the client, you choose the projects. And, you know, when you work for someone else, it's always the the, the guilty pleasure, you know? Yeah. You, you complain with your college and on sure. things to make you feel better, but not anymore. But, you know, again, no, no regrets. And what do these projects look like? What does Curious Bear Management really specialize in? To be fair, like it's still a, a, a discovery working progress. Um, mm-hmm. But I would say uh, most of the client and what the project I would like to do are uh, a meaningful a meaningful business meetings, and so mainly are uh, conference and association gathering for now. Um, what I what I find out that I think most of my passion and my strength so far is uh, helping uh, helping the client to grow, uh, and then that is most of my projects are. So they are either uh, small trade show who who struggle during the pandemic and need to rebuild. Uh, or they are regional association who who never hire a even professional before, but now uh, they need to, and and they see the big difference. Uh, or working with a, a giant volunteer committee who used to do everything and and now need to uh, to help them to guiding through there is a better way to do it. Um, and so that's kind of the project that I have been I have been I have been starting to get involved. Um, Kind of what's the next step actually is uh, I am starting to go into uh, working on some research project actually that I'm quite excited about um, that I have some conversation with a few different companies that and that's probably pretty in line with the conversation we may have later on is is all around data that I think uh, I'm going to ex- involve with some very exciting data projects that that hopefully that will help demonstrate some of the you know some of the the assumption or some of the theory that industry always have on how attendee behavior look like and people might want to so pretty exciting about it i think in general is anything that keep me curious and <laughs> and that is a project i'm getting on that's what the name about that's the name curious bear and you've also kept going something we started a while back right the event profs break shit which is the kind of testing of event technology, which is an area that you're also quite focused on. Uh, you did uh, some work recently with PCMA, I believe, at the Convening Leaders and the EduCon event where you tested out some technology live. Uh, is that That's also a, a project that you're passionate about? Mm-hmm. Yes. So I think uh, the, the thing we start now is into probably the third or fourth year, right? And um, it, it started out from just uh, the frustration of the event tech solution are na- not able to communicate properly with the planner like us uh and then that now that kind of expanding into something i think it's almost become an advocate project in my opinion is uh try to take the active role of help to breach both sides and the approach at least from from my perspective is to um to design uh, to design a session or environment that will create they that that will make it easier for the planner to consume but at the same time also um allow planner to share their feedback in a in a in a in a non-biased and, and more honest way so the uh the tech company will be able to hear and listen and so, so just for people listening yeah. i mean these sessions this is what i think the session looks like but you can correct me so you yeah. have 
something like five technology uh, representatives on stage that sort of pitch their software with a, with a limited time. And then the audience responds to that and sort of votes on which ones they like best. How does that part work, that part, that part of the design? So, um, we, so funny enough, we actually, that was actually one of the idea, but it actually didn't really fulfill because uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I think for, for what we have been doing for the past at least two rounds with PCMA, so we did uh, actually three rounds. So I think for the Educon last year, Convenient Leader this year, and Educon this year, who just passed a couple of weeks ago, uh, we work with them and basically curated, basically we curate two things for them. One is we curate a list of technology who either unheard of in the industry or even they heard of, they they probably have something that people don't know about it or people want to learn about it. Uh, and then secondly, we, 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 based on the tech company that we, we are able to curate and, and gather, we design session uh, accordingly. And, and what we have been trying to do is for each tech company have a chance to shine, uh, but in a way that is not just a sales pitch. Um, so for example, um, with the uh, with with the AI uh, startup uh, who are uh, making kind of making its way and name in the industry, uh, who who claim that their product is uh, is a generative AI tool designing for the event industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of using ChatGPT, you can use them because they speak the language of event planner. And so instead of have them, you know, get on stake and get on stage and talk about it, we uh, we design a competition. So we 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 actually put them right in the center and and with no filter, uh, and have them compete with people either with other AI tools or with people who have no AI tool, and then to see how the result look like in a timely, uh, in a timely fashion. And honestly, the 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 result was very fascinating it's that uh, people be able to see how they work and whether they like it or not, they see life. But at the same time, we also find out there's a lot of the uh the the user behavior that no one uh no one can think about before we start seeing people kind of how they're using it how they react to it life so it becomes it that's kind of what the whole spirit of event prop ratio at the beginning is to uh, not just for the planner to test it but also give the tech company a, a rare case to see how their product being used and therefore they can take it back to either fix something or to improve something. Makes sense. So you tested, you had a sort of a case study or a, a scenario, right? And then you asked part of the group to um, work on something with AI, with the help of AI, and another part of the group to work on something without AI. So it was a kind of a, a competition element, right? And then what yeah. we wrote, I think from this, I think it was from the convening leader session. So in mm -hmm. January was that the the ones that didn't use AI actually won. So there was a sort exactly. of a judging panel as well, right? And ultimately the ones without AI won. And I think it was that they were a bit more creative. So the AI created something much more detailed, but it wasn't as creative as the non-AI kind of group, right? Yeah. And then like, so for Educon just a couple of weeks ago, I think PCMA probably going to write about it is we, we take this step further, but this time is... The other team are also using AI, but they can use any AI tool except the uh, the AI tool that the company. Okay. You can mention Brad. It's okay. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's, it's Spark AIs, and and um, and so the other side they are using uh, Cloud, they're using ChatGPT, they're using uh, the, all the other tool that you can thinking about and compete with Spark AI. Uh, and and funny enough, actually, again, Spark AI didn't win the run because we had three round of competition. But okay. uh, the converse, the discussion was very fascinating. Again, is um, is 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 really because how because it's still showing how uh, I, I think that there's a lot of user case about AI is it, it come down to uh, you need to think about who actually the user. Um, so for the using the competition as the example is the Spark AI team are um, the Spark developer who are competing with three planner who are using other AI tool. And although the Spark team, they know their product very well, when you are in a, in a, in a, in a, in a competition perspective or when you've been handing over a task, 
the, the thought from a planner is still very different than the thought from a software engineer. Mm-hmm. And that that directly impact how the prompt you are giving to the AI, and then that directly impact how the result will look like. And, and so this is just something that I think is just fascinating to, to see, right? It's not about you had a... It, you can try to create a tool as much as you want that you think will help the end user, for our case, the event planner. Um, but until the end user actually using it, you won't really know how they actually will use it. Yeah, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. So I want to unpack that a little bit. Um, I mean, it's interesting that uh, that uh, Spark AI had their sort of development team being there. That almost feels like cheating, but I can see <laughs> how that might have actually worked against them because they're yeah. not planners, right? They're developers. Yeah. So they can create a prompt that, comes out with a really nice answer, but it doesn't mean that that answer has the most value, right? Whilst a, a real planner will be asking, will be asking and also will be able to detect what has real value from what the AI produces. Yeah, and I guess I think that is one of the common mistake uh, on AI user case this day is uh, no matter how you use the AI or Nampeter or no matter what AI tool you are using, um, as the end user, which as a human being, we always need to double check it, right? We still need to go through the answer and then re-edit it in a way that we believe as a human makes sense. And, and that is a common mistake because we think AI can save our time and they can maybe basically do our job. Uh, the first one is correct. They can potentially save our time, but the second part is just never the true case. Is they will never be able to replace the end user because we will still know what is the best way to like, or we still know what is the answer we want it right. Okay, I mean from a from a media perspective, my view on that is you can get any of the leading AI companies to create um, blog posts and mm-hmm. you know kind of content that is that looks very normal, you know, looks decent, looks like it's been interesting, has a sort of a structure, has a a flow to it and kind of makes sense. But when you actually read it, when you go into it in detail, there's not usually a lot of substance in there. There's usually a lot of, you know, kind of fancy sentences, interesting ways of doing, saying things or things that sort of sound, you know, lots of adjectives, lots of expressions. But when you come down to it, I rarely see, or when I know that something's been created by AI, or I suspect mm-hmm. there isn't usually a lot of substance in there, right? And I feel yeah. like this goes back to an example that I've used a lot, which is when when a person wants to use AI to help them, they'll give them kind of three bullet points and then say, you know, write an article based on these three bullet points or something like that. And it can do that. And then if you want to, you know, the reader, the expert reader that reads the article we might might ask AI to take the article and distill this article into three bullet points, you know, and end up with pretty much the same thing. Because really, if if all you're saying are three simple things, the AI is just adding a lot of fluff. Is yeah. that is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah, I think that's specifically for a lot of the the creative work, right? That you uh, and and I, I'm I'm like I personally experienced that actually for the past few months is I, I did realize because so when AI first came in uh, or at least when generative AI to be more specifically first become massive adoptive, uh, it was fascinating to, to me and I, I personally experienced a tremendously help because of it. Um, so and I, I remember last year for like I'm able to run three different events with three different marketing needs and campaign all by myself last year, just because of the help of AI, right? Because of the help that you can put in as three simple prompts and come up with the contents. And then you still added it, right? Like, don't get me wrong, you're still editing a little bit. And, 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 but it really helped you to speed up. Um, but this year, what I what I kind of realized, and and the, the thing is that the more you're putting out, the more you realize is how similarity they are, mm-hmm. and how much, uh, like you say, how much fluff they are, right? And you're kind of like losing that unique voice in some way for what you should technically for every individual project, right? So that I think so. I I actually stop. I actually start using it last 
this year. Um, not because I don't believe in it, but it's actually really because I, I feel I, I kind of haven't been able to figure it out the yeah. way that I would then satisfy it. So do you think AI can ever really replace an expert? That's a really good question. The 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 thing is, I think the answer really is I don't I, I don't know, but I think it depends on how the definition of expert is, mm-hmm. right? Because um if the expert is um unique creative contents or decision, uh then I don't think they will ever able to. But if the expert mean uh extending knowledge on operate on a certain tool or database or 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 using or 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 a certain skill, then I actually think AI can potentially, right? It's almost like when email first came into place, like that is a I believe at the time, I don't think I even born yet, but I believe at the time there is a debate that if the the typewriter will ever be replaced, mm-hmm. right? Because who will use email? But like yeah. look I now, right? Okay. I mean, so I guess my view on that is somewhat mixed in the sense that I think replacing expertise is always a tricky topic and it's very hard to really know what the future holds, of course. Um, But what I've heard from some AI experts is that if you can explain what an expert does, if you can break down the process, and I think the easiest example is to think about this in sort of medical terms, obviously Mm -hmm. quite a delicate topic. And I'm not by any means suggesting that we should do this, et cetera. But if you're looking, you know, I've seen examples, for example, of AI looking at x-rays and saying, you know, does this patient have something that we should look at, you know, like a tumor or whatever, and is it something we should look at? And an AI can detect or AI can be used with image recognition, et cetera, to detect really small things that might not be visible to the naked eye or to kind of, you know, kind of things like that. And the argument is that if you can explain to the AI, AI what you're looking for, you know, if you can actually map out your mental process of what you're doing when you're scanning an X-ray in this example, then there's no reason why the AI can't do it just as well as you do. Do you subscribe to that, or do you kind of say, "Wait a second, this isn't really"? And I know this is quite an extreme example. I'm, I'm not. I don't want to put you in the position of a, a doctor or anything like that. Or, uh, but I think it's a, it's an easy, easy example to visualize, right? Yeah, totally. And and I, actually, I think so it come down to I think based on what the AI expert described theoretically, it is possible, right? Theoretically, um, I think the reality is we just never be able to see it in a very complete version. The reason is the human expert will always involve. Right, like let's say using the 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 the, the but isn't the that what AI is by definition? Machine learning. Yeah. The definition is, is it learns, right? It, it gets yeah. better as it does the processes. Yeah, it is, and then technically you can do it, right? Technically, you can have multiple experts train on a certain AI machine. So theoretically, that AI machine will ha- equipped with all the knowledge from all the different experts, right? And I think th- honestly, that is something I will even think. Um, you know, all the professional associations should just think about it, right? That is something like, I think, I, I remember, I I think I saw something uh, on the article lately is that is actually quite a few companies are trying to do, or at least in a yeah. certain profession, is to train a AI that that can somehow equip with more knowledge of that certain profession or some way. But the problem pretty- is you still oh. need, like, but the problem is at least... Um, and you know we we might we might eventually accepting the fact that AI is smarter than us we might and then we trust the AI but the problem is at least I think for now we won't right for now um, there's always that due diligence task need to happen and uh, I think it's a constantly battle here and there but I like I, I personally I don't I don't think that we can completely block it or say it won't happen yeah. But I, I don't know how fast it will happen in our lifetime, to be fair. Well, it seems to be happening a lot faster than anybody predicts, right? So that's true. Interesting. True. But let's take it to a more uh, practical example, more on the planner perspective, right. or at least related to planner work. One area that I've seen, you know, that's always hard to do is poster sessions. 
right. you know, the job of approving a poster. And again, I think it's the kind of thing where you can you can definitely document the process that mm -hmm. people go through, right? You mm -hmm. know, is it the citations? Is it the references? Is it the number of authors? Is it the schools that they belong to? You know, there's all these things that I, I believe in most cases the, uh, you know, the, the, the specialists in each area will be looking for in a poster mm -hmm. and then say, you know, to kind of judge whether it's valid. Uh, and I think for most events, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know this for sure, but I, I think for most events, there is a, a significant proportion of the posters that get approved, right? I think uh, some events might be very stringent, but it's sort of in the event's interest to also approve and have, you know, a number of posters present, right? So it's in their interest to approve as long as they're valid uh, in some way. So it's not, um, it's not a kind of stamp of like, this is genius. This is something that is definitely correct. It's like this research was conducted according to our uh, parameters, which sounds to me like something that you could relatively easily train AI on doing. Um, yeah, te technically, yes, right. And I, I think, I think that is. Oh, but I, I do what need to say. I think for a different industry, um, it's a little bit different, right? It really depends on the need of the of the presenting of their research is, right? I think I believe for some for some industry or for some sector, I think probably the better term is, uh, poster session is is very important in a way that that is also that's almost serve as a training methods for the young researcher for the doc for, for the postdoc or for the doc student right they they're presenting a research but the reason they are not in the main room doing an oral presentation is really very likely it's because the poster is because their research is more like a student project right it's important yeah. but they are not at the level of uh of, of like in terms for quality they are not sure. at the level of need and that's kind of why i'm suggesting i'm not saying that AI, at least at this point, is selecting which speakers should be on stage, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. more selecting which poster should be approved. Because, I mean, in my experience, if you have a, you know, a 4,000 person event that I've done in the past, I think you had 1,200, 1,500 posters, yep. you know, so a third of your audience roughly is at the event because they are presenting yeah, a poster. Yep. So it's a, a huge part of, you know, academic and kind of medical uh, conferences, right? And then I think, to, you know, in that case, I actually think is a good idea to implement some sort of AI scanning tool, right? It's almost like if you think about it right now, um, for HR, you always have the resume scanning, right? And then you can come, you can debating about whether they're accurate or not. You're gonna missing some really good candidate or sort, but it is a, a, a massively efficient way for a lot of the company who always sure. receive a massive imply, right? And then I, I don't think a problem to have that for, uh, let's say, scanning the poster as well, right? I mean, but at, at, but the thing is, though, like I think that is what every committee or the client or association need to make the decision on is how many power they're going to rely on the result yeah. on the AI. Yeah, and I think there's an element of are they going to disclose that AI is being used? You know, right. that's, that's, I think, really important because I think they should. Uh, I think they should, you know, kind of say, and, you know, maybe there's manual checks or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting point. I was also thinking, you know, once, if that is in place, then there will probably be someone else who creates an AI to gen to automatically generate posters that are guaranteed to be approved by the AI, right? Somebody will yeah. reverse engineer the system. And, and is that... You know, because I'm sure people reverse engineer the system now in terms of they know what the professor is looking through the posters are looking for, and they'll make sure to put that in there. But when you have an AI tool doing that, is that then wrong? You know, is that then subverting the system somehow? I think that's that's kind of what I mean. That's definitely a fascinating debate, right? And then to, to, to be fair, in my opinions, uh, and that is kind of what human is fascinated, right? Because we were always trying to find a way that benefit us the most. Yeah. And no matter what the framework or the rule is, right? Uh, and that just means that, you know, maybe the selecting process would then need to get involved, um, the review process need to fix, or the requirement of the poster would then need to adapting, right? It sounds a lot of work, but if you're thinking about it, uh, the reason we even have a poster session at the first place was back to 100 years ago 
uh, people are frustrated the old way of sharing research and they want to find a simple it was funny to say say this right now it's like people want to find a simple most effective way to present their research that's how mm-hmm. poster session being ev- being being basically being designed for and yeah. right now, poster session is considered the last innovative and most boring session in a lot of the association format. So, but a, a huge part of association conferences, right? Or a lot of it's very important, and that, that also just showed the fact that no matter how much you're complaining about the poster is not as effective or old school as it is, you haven't been able to find a better way for people to share their research in a most simple and effective way, right? Well, I want to go back to something you said earlier, which is you're actually using AI less. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the title of this episode is Has AI Jumped the Shark? And jump the shark is an interesting term because I wasn't familiar with it until, you know, someone mentioned it. And then it it turns out very U.S. term. Yeah, very U.S. term based on a TV show that had uh, Fonzie jumping water skiing over a shark in one episode. And that's sort of been uh, kind of now it means more of a kind of past its utility, like the idea that, you know, something is just like not really that useful anymore. It's kind of and. It's kind of strange for me to suggest that AI is not useful anymore, but you said it yourself in the way that you're not you're not using it as much. And mm-hmm. could it be that AI, you know, I mean, I think everybody will agree that ChatGPT really surprised everyone by how impressive the sort of easy results were. Mm-hmm. But as you say, and I've experienced it myself, I think to get really good results is quite hard. And mm-hmm. I think from a sort of marketing and copy perspective, you can get decent results or you can get close or you can create something at scale, you know, that 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 passes, that that's okay, but it won't be sort of genius marketing at any point, right? So it sort of ends up being a tool that will help you with your more menial tasks or with the more kind of relatively simple tasks that you can sort of, that you probably not, don't like doing anyway and take up a lot of time and then it can be helpful. But the promise of AI is so much more. And if we're sort of like reducing it to that, then could we say that AI has jumped the shark or, or is it too early to tell? I think it's too early to tell. I think uh, I, I would I will more say we, we, we right now is really just um, in some way taking a break, at least for, for some of us who are. AI is taking right? a break. So it's got a little little kind of wheel turning, right? It's kind of like not accessible right now. OK, great. Yeah, but it's more for us, right? I think it's really for the user because it's. I think when it first came out, especially for ChatGPT, first came out, I think that excitement and surprise of how the result was was real, right? That 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 the accuracy or the the fast of is fascinated, and and so we also exciting about it, and we also jump onto it, and we we started to implement them, and and I think right now. It's really just for those who have been using them at least for the past year, progressively. Is is this is the conversation we have right now, right? It's like okay, now it's almost like when you first, uh, when you first learn how to, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to walk, and you're so exciting, and so you start like walking everywhere, uh, and then then and then suddenly you kind of realize, you know what? I I don't need to walk every day. Right? Mm-hmm. I can sit, or I can, you know, maybe <laughs> now learn to ride a bike, right? It's kind of like I feel we we kind of at that stage is which I think is a very healthy stage is you, you we take a pause and look at it. All right, this is how we use them so far, and this is some of the challenge. So what should be the next? Right? Should we abandon them or should we keep using it but differently? Or should technology be catching up and changing some different things? Right? I feel we kind of at that stage. Yeah, I think I think it's an interesting analogy that kind of taking a break. Do you, is part of the issue the trusting the platform? I think that is. I think that is one because I think uh, again, like, like I, I won't say myself is a very extreme. Uh, like, well, actually, so like, like, like I believe privacy is very important, but I am guilty as charged that I basically gave away my privacy to almost every online platform. If you think about it, uh, and so I was not as concerned, at least myself, as quite a few other people. But I also acknowledge that concern are real. Right is, do sure. we want to give AI tool who we don't know who own it, with all the information and knowledge that come with us? And I think the more and more is actually for the creative industry, right? Coming down to 
the the copyrights and then the knowledge. Like I think lately, all, all the AI news, at least what I saw, is uh, you know the record company are suing the AI company yeah. because they 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 pick up the song lyric that who will not be authorized. And and I think we're gonna see more and more like those. And I think it's a a good things, right? Is that people need yeah. to realize that and the not is is out of my hand as a user. Um, but it's it's between them need to figure it out from the AI company and then the government and then the maybe the creative source. They need to decide or come up with agreements on this is the way moving forward. So mm-hmm. as a end user, we can still somehow benefit of the collaborative from them. But we're also, you know, there are a lot of kind of private AIs or AIs that are only trained on uh, a company's data. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's a huge opportunity here for associations that have I agree. You know, years and years of video content of poster sessions. And if they get AI to train only on that data, then they can have a almost a very smart advisor that can help lots of people within that field, right? Um, yeah. I mean, maybe there's a jumping the shark in the sense of we had AI. Uh, it really impressed us for a few years, but it was kind of stealing everybody's work. And what was impressing us was probably how similar the output was to a lot of the things that we see and and like, mm-hmm. right? But now that we know what the tool is capable of, if you start to train it on specific things, then I think it can use its power in a, in a much more controlled manner. Do you think that's the bulk of where you're going to see the the progression. I mean, I, I don't think from a sort of consumer perspective, that's where everybody's head is at. From but from a meeting planner perspective, that might be more realistic. Yeah, I think so. And then I mean, actually, just thinking about it, I think an, another good comparison is social media, right? Because if you think about it, when social media first came up, you know, the Facebook, the Twitter, everyone's so exciting, right? And we, we, let's specific talking about the event industry is everyone's so exciting. And suddenly uh, managing social media become one of the job event planner need to do, right? And then that for a couple of years and that becomes so exhausted and the job of social media alone becomes so, so, so complex. And, and then you kind of, rec- and then so what it, it became is it kind of progressed into a, a individual role, right? So like you are hiring a social media coordinator or you will be falling under some sort of other category. For some association or company, it might still under the planner, mm-hmm. but the user case is got reduced dramatically, right? Like you are not, then you are not expecting the planner to run your social media community and to get engaged and blah, 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 right? If you want to do that, you actually need to hiring a person who dedicated to do that. And that person actually equipped with better knowledge than the general planner, right? That person will know the algorithm better. That person would actually be able to create a more compelling graphic or content to fit with social media. And, and I think I, I kind of had a feeling that I think in, if in a good scenario, that would be a great way how AI will evolve in the industry is we, we're starting to have AI expert, right? That specifically on how to implement AI into either your events or into your organization. Yeah, but I'm going to disagree with you there slightly as hey. a recovering social media consultant in the industry. All right. Um, what, what I found in my experience was that companies were expecting one person internally or externally to sort of do some social media magic and make them really good on social media. And it didn't really work because Mm. when the company was sort of relying on one person to come up, the content was very basic, right? It was sort of like, oh yeah, we got some nice pictures from the last event. Can you put them on social media? And, And there wasn't raw participation from everybody else. And I feel that with AI and using that same kind of comparison, it's it sounds like it, it's better if the expert comes in and trains people, you know, on mm-hmm. how to use AI securely and in an adequate way and not break copyrights and do all these things to really take the benefit of AI across the company. Because, you know, we've talked about there's so many different use cases. This is not meeting planning specific AI necessarily, but AI in general. Um, I believe, and from what I've seen from companies that are investing in sort of AI training and external help on on improving the solution is more about getting everybody on board right because also if you look at things like microsoft copilot and gmail Mm -hmm. that are all sort of integrating ai 
into the platforms, we're all already using AI. You know, unless you sort of turn everything off and do everything manually, which I don't think a lot of people do, we're all already kind of using it at least in small amounts, right? So isn't the solution more to get everybody to a sort of next level of understanding of AI so that they can actually take advantage of it? I think that is. I mean, I think that is actually another good solution, right? To to see how how you go. Um, I can see the like, and I agree with you that in order for an organization uh, to 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 fully benefit from AI, uh, you need buying from uh, across the across the organization and not just one single person. Um, but depending on the task and depending on what the need of AI, I think I, I think that there is still argument point that is if you should have a dedicated person who 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 whose sole job is to either potentially implement it or, or run it. But I, I definitely agree with you that it's not that person's job to make magic happen with a limited resource. Yeah, for sure. Great. Well, Sean, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I think we've covered uh, most of what we were attending to. Has AI jumped the shark? Well, I don't know. It, it sounds like we're a little undecided on that one, but there seems to be some signs that it might have, or at least it's it, it's taking a bit of a break, as you put it. Yeah. So, yeah, taking a break. Yeah, taking a break. Love it. Sean, uh, thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoyed uh, joining us on the podcast. For everybody listening, uh, we'll have uh, notes of this uh, episode on our website. I hope you uh, enjoyed the conversation as much as I do. And don't forget to check out the other podcasts uh, that Skip produces and uh, catch you on the next episode of the Skip Meetings podcast. Once again, thanks, Sean, for joining us today, or Yixing for joining us today. Thanks, Miguel. Appreciate it. Hey there, if you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts, please make sure to subscribe, rate us five stars, or leave us a positive review. That really helps us get out the word about the Skiff Meetings podcast and make sure that we can continue to bring you this podcast every week, absolutely free of charge. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the Skiff channel and hit the notification bell to find out whenever a new video drops.